Phase Zero Spotlight episode starts right now. Happy Friday, everybody. I'm BD, joined today by Jenna Anderson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Spotlight. This is our third Spotlight episode now since we have like started the whole Spotlight name, right? We did Tom Hiddleston and Mon Villani. I think that's those are the two so far, right? This is a good one, though. Uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy, one that Jamie and Aaron did. The VFX uh, team on Guardians of the Galaxy. So this is our fantastic fourth uh spotlight episode and it's a good one it's one i'm very excited about and i know that everybody who has been following phase zero and at comicbook.com is quite excited about because what if season two was so fantastic and now we have a chance to talk about it and i'm excited for this because joining us now we have writer and executive producer ac bradley writer and executive producer matt chauncey and director and executive producer brian andrews live on phase zero hello everybody hello Hey there. How's it, how's it feeling to have What If Season 2 out in the world? Pretty good. Take it. it took a while. <laughs> so it's kind of nice. Um, I, gotta, I, I, I would love to, because this is the first time we've seen any, I can't think of any show that's done a release, a, a daily release, also during the holidays. I don't think, I definitely don't think I've seen both of those, let alone daily at all. So how did you guys spend the holiday season with your show dropping one episode? I mean, you'd already seen them, I know, but you know, what was it like to kind of have this this little gift each day of the holidays as the people who made it? I spent a lot of time on Twitter that I haven't, more time on Twitter <laughs> in the last two weeks than I have in like two years. Yeah. And then following on Instagram and texting with like the guys has been a lot of fun. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely different. <laughs> it was, it's, you know, it's weird. It's like, def, you know, it's like um, AC had mentioned before, you know, that it was, it's like an advent calendar. You get something new every day. But just hearing the random stuff come at you from friends or colleagues or whatever, something they just, they, you know, they just watched the thing. And yeah, it's, 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 it was wild. Like it's such a unique way of doing it, you know? It's, yeah. It's, it but it was cool. Fun I like season. It. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I got one of those, uh, one of those little boxes in the mail and each one had a little candy in it, the nine boxes. And I'd sit here with my mom and we'd taste the candy and watch uh -huh, the episode uh -huh. together. So it gave us something fun to do. So we appreciate cool. that. Uh, so on today's episode, we're kind of just going to go episode by episode, ask a, a few questions about each episode and have some fun with it. But first, just for everybody who's listening in podcast form uh, and doesn't have the video up, which is the majority of our audience, we love our podcast listeners. Hmm. Could you guys just introduce yourselves and your role so that uh, everybody knows your voice and who they're listening to if they can't put uh, a face to the name? Uh, oh. Sure. I'm the female with a slightly high pitched <laughs> voice. Uh, my name is AC Bradley, uh, writer, producer um morale cheerleader <laughs> <laughs> matthew what about you uh i'm matt chauncey i'm a writer producer as well and uh i guess i was the doom and gloom person if she's the cheerleader <laughs> uh, yeah my name is brian andrews director producer and um i'm just slugging away trying to get it out the door <laughs> trying to finish it all up the cinema guy the cinema guy. Mars he's still deep, he's I'm still deep, deep in season yeah. three. Yeah. Still at work on season three. Well, we'll talk about that at the end in whatever capacity we can. I know it's all secrets at Marvel, but we'll try. We'll pull those teeth. We'll pull those teeth. Well, so speaking of cinema and kind of diving into season two, uh, Blade Runner is one of my favorite movies. So I loved what you guys did with the Nebula episode. I thought it was so much fun. How did you balance homaging that movie and kind of the cyberpunk genre without getting too far into parodying it? Hmm. Uh, I, well, I think it's um, with the writing of the episode, that was one thing, you know, the story was the story. So I think, you know, we're not really trying to parry that stuff. Was when it comes to the visual element, um, it was relatively easy. I mean, because I mean, it's so iconic. It, it set the stage, it created a genre of its own, the whole, like you said, the whole cyberpunk thing. Um, so when we said, yeah, let's just, we got to go Blade Runner. It's like everyone across all with the character designers the art department story people layout just everyone immediately knows aha and so th there's an aesthetic so we can just shoot for that aesthetic the, and we've all grown up with it we've all seen that stuff and influenced by it so it's easy for us to kind of just jump in there and and get and get dark gloomy noir big you know like we know what to do we've been seeing it since we were kids like we get it so that was fun because so I, there was, I don't think there was a danger when it came to that aspect, the visual aspect, um, but also because the story was so, you know, well done and fantastic that sets the stage and then allows us 
certain guardrails within the nature of the story to be like aha and then so for this thing we can get this crazy with it and for this thing we can do this with it and stefan frank was the the director on that um uh because we were so busy doing all the other things you know we need a little extra help um and and you know and he rocked that one for sure and he loves the blade runner aesthetic and and the rest of it so it, it was it was in great hands you know all, all across the board everyone had a lot of fun working on it I'm going to, I'm going to follow up on that for the writers because I am a huge Nova fan and seeing the Nova mm -hmm. core in guardians one made me very happy yet. Even though Kevin Feige promised it in an interview, I still haven't seen Richard Ryder. <laughs> did you guys ever consider uh, introducing my favorite comic character in this episode? That was one quite one uh, ask that I think we knew we probably wouldn't have been allowed to do. So I don't think we bothered with that one. Uh, and we knew, having worked with Karen Gillan in season one, that we were just like so excited to have an opportunity to put her center stage. And so putting her in that context and having her be, you know, the Nova equivalent for this episode, we were kind of stoked on. And, and yeah, Nebula is such a fantastic character. And it felt like you guys really were, even though I know this is a variant that isn't in like the sacred timeline, this did just feel like such an authentic extension of her story. Yeah. yeah, unlike the in season one, you know, we did the Veronica Lake kind of femme fatale nebula and the T'Challa Star Lord, which was so far afield from what we know her from the movies. And so this was, yeah, it was a story that you could actually see like our version of Nebula having, which is, yeah, which is cool. So the lineup for the 1980s episode is so great. Um, I That was honestly probably my favorite episode of the entire season. How did you guys land on that group of characters and what made them kind of the perfect Avengers team to assemble in that context? Um, well, I think the first thing we did was just kind of looked at the, we knew we wanted to do an episode set in the past. I think that was also like a, a mandate from the studio at the very inception of the show. And then we just started looking at the history of the MCU as it exists, which is uh, what we've learned over the course of this show is that it's so rich and detailed. And there were just, there were actually so many characters who were active in the eighties. And then it was about, so we actually had a lot to choose from. And then it was about, okay, what configuration of characters could actually give us an emotional story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think AC was the one who like locked on to the idea that both Hope Van Dyne and Peter Quill were dealing with the losses of their respective mothers at this point. And so I think from there, all the other characters kind of fell into place around that sort of emotional nugget. Mm -hmm. It was one of the episodes when I, gosh, in October, 2018, when I met with Brad, he gave me a list of like, it was like four or five ideas that like him and the parliament and Kevin had like came up with. And one of them was we want to do like an 80s Avengers. And their their what if was Yondu didn't betray ego. He delivers Peter Quill to Earth. What happens next? And I came back to him. I'm like, it's actually kind of simple. Yeah, it's, you know, everything blows up. But I was like, <laughs> what's missing is the heart. And if you just look at it, Peter Quill and Hope Van Dyme, they both have in canon lost their moms around the same time. And you make it a found, a found family story. And that's basically as far as I got with it. It was just in the conversation with Kevin. And he was like, yeah, that's it. Um, and so we had it earmarked for season one, Matt, for a long time. And then it, f oh, it and then we were doing the Star-Lord uh, T'Challa episode. So it got pushed or it got put in the back burner and I'm so happy we were able to do it in season two. And then Matt did the lineup, which I love the fact that you got uh, Michael Douglas uh, flirting with Captain Marvell in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, you've mentioned this in interviews before. Sorry, but I love huge. it so much. Ah, I'm a huge American president fan, so I have sort of shoehorned. Uh, I really wanted to see Annette Benning and Michael Douglas on screen together, albeit in animated form. And so getting that in was satisfied a lot of life. And you just casually put Kurt people. Russell and Michael Douglas in the same room. Right. <laughs> yes. like, yeah. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, the the next episode was I love the Christmas episode, yeah. what the 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 Die Hard at Avengers Tower. I love spending time at Avengers Tower too, just in general. Happy Hogan becoming Freak was awesome. It's a purple version, but so the, the obviously the difference from Freak in the comics is the color, like the, the kind of a bit of the appearance. But he also maintains control 
of himself mm-hmm. instead of ruining Christmas, as I imagine Freak from comics <laughs> probably, but he saves Christmas. So I would love to, you know, how'd you guys consider, uh, you know, bringing this version of Happy Hogan from, from you know, an alternate version of him to the to the screen? How much fun was that? And who's the Die Hard fan that demanded all the references? <laughs> I, I love Die Hard, but it was really, so does Matt. It was pretty mutual, I think. So we... I don't want to say this. So in season one, there was a hot second where we thought we were going to be able to do a Christmas episode and it was going to be, what if the Avengers showed up in Iron Man? Three. Three. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And, and we sort of, it was very much like a love actually kind of vignette episode. Oh, nice. <laughs> but it didn't make the cut. We actually spent an afternoon at Mendocino Farms breaking it. But we're Cafe like, no, gratitude, we're gonna... Ashley. What? <laughs> Cafe gratitude. Oh, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> Having our princess salads. And, <laughs> and we broke it. And then when we went back into the office, like a, a couple days later, they're like, oh, no, we're not doing that one. Got... I think it actually got killed for zombies early on, which is oh wow, totally different. And so when season two rolled around, we're like, oh, there's a way we can get a secret Christmas episode in here. And then the character of Happy Hogan, like, and John Favreau, just his personality. I don't think either was wanting to do a huge departure. We didn't want to do Happy Hogan goes John Wick, and we wanted to keep the tone kind of fun and light. And then once you start doing the Die Hard, so that's why the freak doesn't go full comic book freak. We didn't. It wouldn't match tonally with what we were going for. Um, but that was actually one of my favorite episodes to write because we were speaking of Matt being at times Mr. Doom and Gloom. We were writing it literally the first days of the, the lockdown. Oh, and wow. I remember Matt called me up once. I remember the phone talking about the episode. And Matt just goes, are you going to have Christmas? Is it going <laughs> to be a thing? Like, I was like, I don't know, man. I was like, the world's ending. But we're getting paid. So let's just keep going. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm glad you guys kept we're in there, uh, keep a little light in there, in that, in that tunnel. So speaking of the Christmas episode, fans have been waiting over a decade to see Sam Rockwell back as Justin Hammer. Um, how did that come to be? What made him the perfect villain for your Die Hard episode? I, was it your idea, Matt? I think it might have been to bring back Rockwell. I, I mean, yeah, I think we all just love him. We were trying to think about who, when we knew it was going to be Die Hard and Avengers Tower, it was like, okay, who is our Hans Gruber? And I think he just like quickly popped to uh, the fore. Mm-hmm. And Brian, what's the key to directing a good uh, Justin Hammer dance scene? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, there's a lot of a lot of video reference online, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then you know, handing a ton of it over to the animators and saying, please, please. <laughs> this because sam sam rockwell will watch it and he will be mad at us if it does not because <laughs> uh, he's he's an, i mean he's a, he's incredible and his you know his acting of course and everything else but you know but he's also an amazing dancer and, and he was excited that we're gonna I, mean, I told him it's like dude we're totally having you dance this thing and he was stoked he was pretty pretty happy about it. he's like do you really that's cool man he's, he's that's very gro- he's very groovy he's very groovy that's cool. That's cool. I also, I, I, one thing I love about this episode is seeing like the Christmassy Avengers when they show up and, you know, and also you guys took a shot at Hawkeye in this episode and I, I'll admit, I laughed, I laughed but the, uh, the Hawkeye toy is not selling. Oh yes. my gosh. What it, it's, did Hawkeye it, do to you? Nothing actually. I, I am, I am huge Hawkeye. Like I've been working on Marvel stuff for, for forever. And, um, all the Avenger movies and I'm always giving Hawkeye like amazing stunts to do amazing things to do making like all the cool stuff that people see him do and with the bow and stuff a ton of that is just is like literally me drawing it and giving it to the directors and being like he should do this they're like yeah you should so I am down for Hawkeye right but it's an appropriate <laughs> joke right because like <laughs> Right out there, there people like to kind of you know take pot shots at poor Hawkeye, and it just made it just made sense, and it went with that joke that you know um, you know AC put in, it, you know, it, the, getting the one Christmas toy. It's kind of it's kind of like jingle all the way, right? It's like mm-hmm. a little little, little bit of thing. Mm-hmm. So there's got to be the one, mm-hmm. and of, of course it's going to be Iron Man. You know what I mean? But but I love mm-hmm. that um, he gave us so much great 
riffs on that whole thing mm-hmm. um, and i wish you know again we had a little bit more time in the episode to add to to leave in some of the some of the extra magic that we get from our, our, our all the talent that you know is on the show because there was some stuff he was riffing on where he's talking to the little kids going like encouraging them they're like how about this how about that? <laughs> he's, great. he's got a bow it was really like sweet and sincere and Aww. stuff and, and just really kind of like but he's cool he's awesome I mean, come on <laughs> you know but you know time right we can't put yeah. it all in um but no but believe me dude I, I love me some hawkeye so hey man it was a good joke i appreciate it was it. a good I joke what's that i'm glad people caught it because the art department putting in the thing of like because it's like mm-hmm. really close to christmas and there's so many that they're like marking off the prices and oh. getting them like like 50 25 percent off no fuck 50 percent off it's 50 percent off <laughs> what's no, called the dice is that the joke comes up twice because it comes up in the actual episode but then it's really big in the background painting yeah. in the <laughs> credits, oh, yeah. and so that's like the, that's where it like really cuts yeah. deep. yeah yeah a darker sense of humor would have had a black widow toy falling off the shelf <laughs> no oh. <laughs> that's... but so the hawkeye one was good the hawkeye one yeah, was great it was a good joke uh the, the, the episode four was the the gamora episode it's referred to as the gamora episode but it's very much an iron man episode and so i'm curious, so in that regard why was gamora the character who went on to become the guardian of the multiverse rat in season one because this was originally a season one episode rather than this right. variant of tony stark I, well it started off as a tony stark episode and then during development it was actually supposed to be a tony stark and pepper episode And Mm. then during development, everything shifted um, and it became a Gamora episode. And it was kind of interesting because we've never examined what made her leave Thanos. Like we never, and this is obviously a variant version of it, but there was some story there that we haven't tackled. Uh Um, And then when it came to the season one, like who does the watcher pull from the episodes? It was either going to be her or Tony. And it was like, her outfit was cool. This notion of like, she's got something, she's got an emotional connection to the infinity stones that Tony didn't have. And um, because her, it was, you know, Thanos was the one who was collecting them. She's now made the infinity gauntlet because of her understanding of what these stones are capable of. It felt more right for her to be the one taken. Mm-hmm. She's sense. the expert. Yeah. 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 So it also made that moment. I, it would have played better, I think, had the episode aired in season one, but yes. you're expecting the watcher to take Tony. And so there's kind of a fun switch, like switcheroo when he takes Gamora, whereas like the way it aired because of the episode order, it was just sort of maybe a little confusing. Yeah. But like, I think if you'd seen the episode, you would have, it would have like played with your own expectations about how this should go. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone assumes Tony would be the one that would be taken. But Gamora is the one who knows the stone the stones better than anyone. Yeah. So kind of going off of that, the end of this episode is very satisfying with Thanos getting killed off by the two of them. Is there a chance we could see that Tony and that Gamora kind of continuing their cosmic adventure in a Thanos world, or is that book kind of closed? That's a question for the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> it would totally be fair. cool. I mean, a lot of the stuff that's been created, like both in oh. season one and going into season two, I mean just in, in hearing people's reactions and things that they that they like about them like there's certain combos of characters or certain storylines that have been, the people really like certain things that have been created you know like oh this world this timeline this whatever you want to call it, this universe these people um it would be awesome to be able to revisit some and and, and see them that was something we talked about in the early days i mean that star lord to child episode from season one in the early days like we were so happy with it and the studio was so happy with it everyone was so happy with it the idea was you know, before poor Chad's make Chadwick pass, the idea was to, that was going to be its own spinoff show, just straight up, just like, let's just do a lot of adventures with this, this gang and do cool stuff. And, you know, it's funny. I, I think there is a, a desire to see some of these other favorite fun things like expand, whether or not that happens or not, that's, that's, that's above our pay grade. We don't know, but uh, I, I feel the same way. I think it would be awesome to revisit some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, there's some amazing characters and, uh, some amazing stories that still could be mined, you know, from from some of this. And yeah, it's it's like visiting old friends. They're, they're and, and new friends, people that you never knew that you're gonna love as much as you do, <laughs> or combos that you never knew you're gonna dig as much as they as you do is when you finally see it, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I I for one would love to see more of a variety of the ones that we've done. It'd be great. 
yeah it, it's got to be hard to just do you like some of these episodes a lot of us are like i wish that was 90 minutes long i wish that was two hours long so i imagine That's for you guys true. you got 30 minutes and you say goodbye but for you it's like months of work and then it becomes 30 minutes and you say goodbye it yeah. starts off usually with 40 page scripts originally our mandate was 35 to 40 minute episodes but because of production issues a lot of them got edited quite to the yeah. bone Wow. Like there's about five minutes from every single episode that's been cut. Wow. 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 Yeah. It, well, I mean, this episode as a whole was cut from season one and pushed back to season two just to get it done. And I I think was I think one of you said that there was a Spider-Man episode from season two that got cut. Oh, that was in script form. It didn't it never made oh, okay. words. I wrote an episode of Spider-Man that was real dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh 30-something Spider-Man. Uh Ashley has a fascination of what happens to heroes as they grow up and the line between villain and hero not being like being drawn in sand and not cement. And it got dark. It was written during a dark time. <laughs> like June 2020. I think everyone can like be like, yeah, that was that was a hard month. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Look at my diary from June 2020. It might be tough. Uh, this, and then the next episode, what was uh, episode five, right? Yeah. The, the, oh, this is the Peggy Carter basically Winter Soldier remix. Mm -hmm. with, but this is also the first episode of, of anything What If related that had multiverse saga references because it references the Black Widow movie too. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear about kind of how it started to evolve when you guys got far enough along because I assume this was written in 2020. Black Widow was. I guess hitting theaters are about to release at that point. The, the collaborative effort diving into phase four stuff as well. Why, I mean, also the Winter Soldier spin on it was great, great too, but you, you got to touch on the, the newer stuff as well. Well, I think one of our last days on the studio lot was Matt and I caught an early screening of Black Widow, right, Matt? I was like, there's like only a week or two yeah. before the lockdown. And we'd already um, read the drafts um, a few times, like the different, like as it was in development. So that one was one that we could play with more because it had already been shot. <laughs> uh, it was harder with like, Matt can talk about this. So it was like uh, Shang-Chi. Mm -hmm. The script was going through rewrites. The production had been paused because of the pandemic. So as you can, Matt will talk about this during the Hella episode, you couldn't do present day Shang-Chi as much because we didn't really know what exactly that was going to be just yet. And so, but with Black Widow, since it had been shot, we knew we could see the movie. That's kind of the problem with writing with animation. You write so far, um, you're writing two, three years out that we don't know what the MCU is going to look like mm. <laughs> around the same time it airs. Um, like we were writing, like this was, we were writing season two and Loki season one had like paused filming. That hadn't even finished yet. So that's why we couldn't use like yeah we finished title. loki we finished season two like nine or ten months before loki season one even came out so wow. that's i don't know just kind of wild to yeah think wow well actually yeah. after season two of what if matt and i jumped onto ms marvel mm -hmm. and we were mm -hmm. on that all through production and that came out a year before this which is it's just it's wow. insane the way animation wow. works. So I, I think based on kind of what you just said, this might answer this question, but I, I as a geek who loves to hmm. hear this stuff and think about the future, this one actually comes from the comment section, what am I on YouTube is their username. Uh, are you guys allowed to use characters which aren't introduced in the MCU yet, but became part of like Marvel rights, like Fantastic Four, X-Men and Ghost Rider back around the time, that was just shortly before you were writing season two that those character rights came back to Disney. So were those like off the table characters or is it, you like just wanted to do stories with characters we already knew. They're pretty they, much off the table. Like we were told. They were like, given the watcher. Yeah, <laughs> it, like, they were the, like, no, we have to do it first in live. Like they're like, we got to mm. do it first in live action, and then you you get to do it. And we're like, oh man, because like we would have loved to have played with all kinds of toys. But, um, yeah, sure. There was limitations. It's also why we couldn't do um, Sam Wilson's Captain America because we didn't know when that would be coming out. Again, that oh. we were writing season two, season one of Falcon and the Winter Soldier were shooting, pause shooting. The scripts were being rewritten because of other things. And we were like, we don't know when anything's airing. So like we couldn't touch it because we're not allowed to introduce. We're not, so it makes sense. Like let the character live in live action first and then come play in the multiverse. So did this have to, just simply based on the final shot of this season, did this then have to release after Loki season two? That is a, a miracle of things coming together that Brian can speak of better than I can. 
Yeah, at first it was never going to be the tree because when we were doing that, there was no tree. There was no Loki season two. Um, so there was no knowledge of any of this stuff. So at some point it was going to be like, yeah, I'm going to show you some cool stuff. I'm just going to show you an image that really shows the multiverse. But we got kind of that at the end of season one of Loki. We're like, oh, <laughs> so this is the thing with live action being so fast. Sometimes we're shooting for something, planning for something, and and, and occasionally they hit it before we even had a chance to show that off. So therefore we, um, you know, follow suit or, you know, we, 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 so in this particular example, they were doing that stuff. And um, the studio was just like, Hey guys. And they're showing, like, we think we should do this instead of the other painting you guys did. And it was an amazing, beautiful painting of some version of what the multiverse could look like. Big and insane throwing in like Kirby, you know, influences and stuff and just making it be the biggest cosmic thing you've seen. But then they had the tree. So we had to do our version of the tree. The crazy thing was they were still trying to design that shot in live action while they asked us to do it. And we had a deadline too. Um, Cause it was one of those where since it was situations where those deadlines were actually kind of matching and ours was more like rock solid. Like we got to get this to the vendor like pronto and the live action guys are like kind of hemming and hawing. Is this the thing? Is this the thing? So it was our team was like painting up some stuff that was like really awesome. So I, I think we were like informing each other and, and that was really interesting because that rarely gets to happen. Um, so we'd follow, they'd give us something like, that's pretty cool. And like our team would go nuts and do something really rad and send it back. And they're like, ooh. And, you know, meanwhile, Kevin's probably in the background going, <laughs> you know, just loving it. But um, it all turned out great. So um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and then threw it in at the last possible moments at least you know and it made it so well, that worked out that's so cool <laughs> really, really worked so, out. so talking about something that you guys did get to do first uh the reception to cohorty has been unbelievable uh what is it like to kind of work with marvel studios and help them introduce an entirely new hero with like no precedent whatsoever it was awesome i, I it was we, I, we i didn't know if they would fully let us but they finally they kind of got on board and I'm glad they did, you know, and, you know, Ryan Little did an incredible job with it. And there were so many different ways we could have gone with it. And we, we, when we started talking to the, um, you know, the consultants, you know, and figuring out, I remember that first phone call, um, just trying to get just, just some stories and just, you know, which my mining for material. And then we stumbled upon, they were talking about, um, uh, the sky world and um, what they consider thunder beings, what they would call thunder beings, which is where they believe they, they came from, you know, from like outer space, 10 foot tall, blue, you know, powerful. And we were like, that's amazing. And it's like, it kind of sounds a little bit like Avatar. And they're like, yeah, because James Cameron stole it all. Um, but that was amazing. But as soon and then we could talk to talk about portals and, and the importance of that. And then saying how water has a lot of special and cultural significance, especially as another way of looking at a, a threshold to travel from the one world to the next. Um, and I think something came in with that as well as it possibly like, um, so we had that tornado of water coming from the bottom of the thing that all dovetails to things that were in the various mythologies and belief systems and stuff. So we're on this phone call and they're mentioning certain things. And we're just like, God, that's, that's rad that's it that's like that's the depth that's some fun extra details we fully need and it started you know and then start going from there yeah but yeah it was amazing i'm so glad they allowed us to to to, to do it yeah that's so cool so then when did it become part of the plan to have cohorty return in the season finale you know it's funny i forget exactly when that came about i think um i don't know it, it, it was the we loved her and we wanted to find a way to bring her back and it just seemed like that could have been a great way to do it right if if strange is out there trying to do what he's doing um there's a way that maybe they cross paths for whatever reason um so i think somehow it just dovetailed it felt like a natural fit to like oh now here's a great way we can see her again because we didn't want her to just be a a one-off you know necessarily we, we want to have have her exist for real you know in the mcu hopefully moving forward into different mediums whether it's a comic or whether it's a a live action thing who knows you know you just you just kind of answered my next question what do we have to do <laughs> take a hoardy in live action how do we make it happen get her just uh, everywhere i don't dude i don't know man let's let's like a petition and let's yeah. like, you know nail it to the, mean, the store the positive reception might might be the petition itself mm -hmm. it's, yeah it's been yeah. awesome 
Yeah, no, I, I dig it too because um, Jeremy White, who um, you know, who voiced uh, a Dardux, uh, he had a wonderful quote. Um, he was texting me like when you know, the show was hitting and and the, how it was responding to the community and everything, and you know, and he said in an interview too, it's just like it's it's he felt it's fantastic because it's a celebration of their of their culture. It's not just for them. It's not just like some episode. It's not just something. And that's what we always wanted to we wanted to shine a light and elevate and and be and he he felt and the community feels that we we, we did that and that's really great that's a huge compliment you know that's so awesome. proud to have them as partners working with us on the episode it's amazing that's great that's so cool um so it is still amazing to me that you guys got kate blanchett back to do animation um what was it like working with her to kind of show these new sides of hella oh it was amazing <laughs> So good, it's so good. She's, I mean, it's Kate Blanchett. She's incredible. Um, I'm, I'm just glad she said yes, and she, she brought it, you know. And I think she enjoys the character, and this was a way to have it play a slightly differently. And she really sank her teeth into it, I and mean, you can hear it, like in her performance. And that new costume at the end, my goodness! So yeah, cool. I'm, the new design I want, for Ella. Come on, I want that hot toy. Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm waiting to see more of the Hot Toys line for season two because that Sakari and Iron Man figure. I'm like, when does it release? What when is it shipping? I know. Uh, yeah, no, you you guys talked about how you didn't have too much reference on Shang Chi, but you had some great Ten Rings action in that episode mm -hmm. too. How did yeah. you, how did you pull that? Like, how did you make that happen? How was the collaborative process on that to get an understanding of the Ten Rings enough while it's kind of still happening and not released yet to make episode seven? It was it was tricky, but I think um, to AC's point earlier, it's like it's it's it was more tricky for Shang Chi, which is why we couldn't touch Shang, because they didn't know who the character was yet. But in the early things of their development, they knew there was a Win Wu, and they they knew what the rings were going to kind of kind of be doing. We we saw a lot of the early stuff, and some of the um um concepts of of artistically what they were trying to do. We didn't know what the final cinematic look on in in the picture would be live action but we saw the artwork of what they were going for mm -hmm. so we were able to use that as a as a as a but it was a moving target because they're changing things and we're like ah and at some point they're like oh when mm -hmm. this stuff is blue what when did that happen and we have to like change it and then with hopefully not having the vendors yell at us because they're like you didn't tell us we're like sorry we didn't know it's like ever changing it's like a moving target but it was cool and i did i did um i worked on shang chi a little bit um they had me come in and just help uh i was too busy with what if to do any boards but i was able to like they had me come in as like almost like a action brain trust person to hmm. sit with one of their other top board artists todd harris who's a, amazing and the two of us he would do a lot of the drawing with the two of us would riff on the ideas for the sequences together with the directors and the producer and 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 basically build out the action sequences kind of kind of that way so I had like a little bit of an in. I saw where things were going. I had a feeling I was helping to choreograph and handle what the rings were going to do in that sense. Then go right downstairs over to the other office like, OK, so we're doing this thing. And now I guess we can do this thing. We'll see if it lasts. We don't know. So <laughs> it was it's a process. It's a crazy process. Wow. It's, it's a process. Well, we awesome. appreciate the effort. Absolutely. Thanks. Came out we great. Try. We yeah. tried. So the 1602 episode was another highlight for a lot of fans. Um, it's very different from the source material written by Neil Gaiman, both in tone and in terms of the story elements. How did you take inspiration from that comic while still kind of making it a fun, lighter Avengers story? Uh, I pitched a version of 1602. It wasn't the 1602. It was, um, I think it was like Victorian Avengers to get the job, actually. It was one of my pitches or early on. Or maybe in the season one, and I remember Kevin was leading the like the little like, I, I think we send him a log. I have a log line. I'm in a meeting, and he's reading the log line. He goes, "This is a holodeck episode," and I went, "Yes." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, is that I can't tell. I, I love holodeck episodes. I'm a dork." And he was like, "Okay." He's like, "Not season one." And then when season two rolled around, the way we could do a period piece was like, "Well, why don't we do 1602?" Um, and that because of the success, like we everyone was so happy with um, Matt's. Uh, version of zombies we're like okay let's now take 1602 a cult fave and figure it out the issue was it's it's actually it's brilliant and it deals with a lot of actual historical figures 
which is a lot to set up when you know you're only going to have probably 30 minutes. And then we didn't want to do Steve Rogers as an American, I think for very obvious reasons. <laughs> um, so I remember like sitting around with Matt and Ryan and we're just kind of talking about it. And I was like, let me just like the things I would love to see is I want to see Loki as a Shakespearean actor because Tom Hiddleston is one of the best living Shakespearean actors. And I have never been lucky enough to see him perform Shakespeare. Um, and I was like, then I kind of want to play both Ryan and I are really into the Robin Hood mythos. We've read the originals. <laughs> uh, and so we, that kind of came up and it was a kind of came a mixture of like, what's, what's all the things we love about the comic book? What's all the things we can play with in this world? And then we realized that it was going to be a Peggy Carter episode. And then for me, the focus then became what is Peggy's and Watcher's relationship? How do you have a friendship with a god? And why would a god have a friendship with a human? And so that's kind of the way the story evolved. My apologies if it wasn't more mm -hmm. faithful adaptation, if people that's what they wanted. But there was a few mandates floating around that we had to fulfill. Yeah, at that point, one of the mandates was that the episode had to be like an actual what if, which I think, you know, the the game and comic isn't really burdened with that requirement about how it connects to the movie. So I think that uh, that kind of influenced it a lot. Yeah. Although in the development, it remained it remained a holodeck episode for a while in the development in season oh, yeah. two, even in season two. I love a holodeck. <laughs> oh yeah. I love me some holodeck. I don't. I think that I don't know why he felt that. There's just I don't think there's anything wrong with a holodeck. It might have been a compliment. Mm. He is. He is also a Star Trek fan. <laughs> yeah. Because mm. we talked about Q a lot when we were talking about the early development of the Watcher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a very different version of the Watcher. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. God. It's like what if the Watcher was a, a dick? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Instead of Jeffrey Wright, who's everyone's <laughs> favorite uncle. Yes. You, you mentioned it It needed a what if, and I, I, the what if was basically, you know, what if Steve Rogers hit the time stone in Wakanda when he was attacking Thanos? Was that at all, what, did you guys think of that at all because of the, the, the fans wanting to see Steve Rogers return the time stones and go to various timelines? Because that's like one of the most popular fan request is a six episode Disney Plus series of him returning the stones. <laughs> I would freaking sign up to like, write it, hold the freaking boom on it. I'm down for that. That's a great idea. I'll pay to be there. I don't yeah. care. <laughs> you might have to play uh, Captain America, though. I don't know if Chris Evans is coming. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want, I do not want that responsibility. And I can't imagine anybody who would. Oh, my God. The shoes to be filled. Oh my Josh gosh. Keaton does a pretty good job. Yes, does. Josh does a very he good job. So yeah. Absolutely. yeah, he does a great job. So jumping to the season two finale, it really wraps up so many threads from both seasons of the show in some really cool ways. How did you land on kind of culminating with that story of Strange Supreme being the villain and Peggy kind of becoming this ultimate hero? Um, well, at the time, we also, we weren't sure if this would be our last season or not. We kind of were hopeful that we'd have a season three, but knowing that that might not happen, I think it was incumbent upon us to try to make sure the finale did tie up those loose ends and felt emotionally satisfying. Um, and I think with Strange kind of returning to semi villainous roots, I think he, I think Stephen Strange like at his core is someone who always thinks he can fix things. Mm -hmm. And he, after experiencing what he did with the Guardians of the Multiverse and then seeing the multiverse in all of its um, breadth, I think it's just sort of natural for him to sort of start falling into this problem-solving mindset again. So it felt like a painful path to see him go down because, uh, you know, we would have liked to be, if he had learned his lessons a little bit more, but also it felt very right, I think, to us. Uh, yeah stewards of the character do the cast members share their like feedback or thoughts on where the character should go like does benedict cumberbatch come in and say like well you know i think this guy should do something that's terrible <laughs> benedict cumberbatch <laughs> but it's also not even british but uh does, does any do any of the cast members come in and have like a, a lot of feedback on what they want to see or what they think would happen or anything like that well john, Fav john favreau is the one who pitched the freak yeah <laughs> yes. nice. 
That's that cool. was, I mean, that was actually the biggest compliment because we were in early days of season one. Because again, we're writing this, we're writing and making this in like 2019. And um, the show came out in 2021 was that he came in for two episodes and he seemed to enjoy the experience enough that he was like, I'll, I'll do a headline for you in season two, but you got to do the freak story. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. And more than anything, I think it's like the actors, in my experience, it's been like, some of the actors came in so warm and so ready to play and so freaking good at um, animation, which is not always the easiest kind of acting. It's very different than mm -hmm. traditional that we just kind of gravitated toward them. And a prime example is uh, Nebula. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to mispronounce her name, Karen, Karen Gillan, uh, was so amazing and so good. Like you think mm -hmm. she'd done like 45 Pixar movies <laughs> that we're like, we need to get her back in any way, shape or form. And then Matt had the idea of doing like a noir detective Nova story which was just kind of a happy marriage of a brilliant idea and a brilliant actress. That's cool. Yeah, Brian can probably speak to working with the actors a little more, especially for season two and three when it was all over Zoom. But the, oh, yeah. the thing that was heartening, I think it's like good for the fans to know is when we first started working on the show, I kind of had no idea how the actors would feel about doing the show, how much investment they would have, whatever. And these they're always coming in from the middle of something else. Usually it's like on a lunch break from their live action project. And yet they really do always like come to play and have a really impressive like knowledge of their mm -hmm. characters. Like it's strange to be in the middle of like you're shooting Multiverse of Madness and you have to like remember where the original version of your character was like five years earlier before you split off. And it's, it was always impressive how in tune they were with all that history because you know they just have so much on their plate. So that was always like heartening to know as as a fan yeah. just how mm -hmm. in yeah. it. Yeah, that's a perfect really? way to describe it. It is very heartening to know that yeah. they get into it as much as we do, yeah. if not more. Totally. I mean, like Karen, she loved like Veronica Lake Femme Fatale from season one. Like when we showed her the artwork, she was over the moon. She's like, oh yes, yeah. so like she was so into it, and um. Another reason why we wanted to bring her back is she's so cool. She was so great and so giving with her talent and her abilities and her love for what we were doing. I and mean, she's a nerd like us. She loves all that shit. And um, but she loved it. And then we saw like what she was we were doing for the noir one. She's like, oh yeah. I mean, she was so into it. And it's funny too because then you get like um, Chris Hemsworth. He's great and he's so funny and so fun. And he's totally down to do it. I remember we were recording. Um, I think it was. I can't remember. Maybe, I think God was it. It must have been the Party Thor episode, but there was, I forget, it's all blurted now, but um, there was one, he was still in Australia, and he, like, you know, rolling in, you know, so there was a sound studio that's not that far, you know, from where he lives, you know, at this mansion, with his family and everything, and he rolls in, he's got, like, surfboards in the back of the truck, and he was just at the beach doing a barbecue with the fam, he just rolls in, like, does the voice, and he's out, you know, it's hilarious, but... um. <laughs> He made he he made reference. He's talking about I think it was Party Thor in, in, in specifically, but he was just like I like it's just one of the things in between takes, you know, we're setting up some of the thing or whatever. And he's just like I love this Thor. I like this Thor. <laughs> so he he likes himself some Party Thor, and Tom Hiddleston kind of digs Frost Giant Loki. Like they those two versions of themselves in that crazy universe. Each actual actor kind of likes those versions of themselves as well, and they. They then they say so, and it's so fun to hear them enjoy what 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 everyone's worked so hard to create, you know. Uh, and really then they breathe all that life into it. That's the thing I think that's most. Matt, whether you're shooting live action, or whether you're doing animation, you know, if you know our writers are there writing it, and that's a certain amount of thing, and then we're designing it a certain amount of thing. But there's there's that extra special piece of magic, that life, when you finally have the actor. Um, in, in, you know, embody it, inhabit, you know, it's a collaborative process. And to see them come in with those final pieces of life is always so exciting because you never know what they're going to bring. And they find new stuff to enrich everything that we've worked so hard to create. You're like, yes, that's great. Let's do that. You know, um, there was uh, one thing I'll mention is because they showed the teaser for it. It was a season uh, three episode, one that AC wrote um, with, you know, Red Guardian and, and, and Bucky. That was going to be like a season two one, but it had to do a little jump switch because we switched one out. But that's another perfect example. Those guys are, I mean, the episode's great, 
those guys are amazing mm -hmm. in it, and we just can't wait for you guys to see it because it is i mean they're gold together it's incredible it's, and we have america ferrera in that episode yeah she and she's like, yeah. <laughs> and it's great too because it's like we you know in that thing that's there's Lawrence Fishburne and 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 he brought such awesome stuff and you know we'd already recorded America America Ferrer and he's looking at the thing so I'm like reading some lines with him but he was able there's there's some there's some fun stuff that you're able to get because mm -hmm. of who they were and how they were playing the character just tiny little asides that were just additional little bits that just helped them pop uh, but but you wouldn't get that unless you were actually you know working with the actor and having them riff on some things and it's 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 always fun to see how they can plus you know it's it's cool. america ferrera playing a, a hero we know no actually um, or cool. i think she might be she's no i don't think she is i'm trying to remember um she's kind of almost an original the character um uh, or she might appear in the comic books briefly Okay. It's because the last name's Morales. It had to be. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, that's right. That's right. Okay. The, okay. Yeah. Actually, just for for the clickbait, just her last name's Morales. People get very excited about. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I saw that. I saw yeah. that reaction. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, um, oh. But she's great because uh, Matt and I came from. We were in DreamWorks for a while uh, on Guillermo del Toro's shows, the Troll Hunter shows, and. America was on um, the How to Train Your Dragon shows, which were right next to us. So we would hear her recordings all the time. And she's such an amazing actress. And I'm so glad she is getting her flowers when it comes to Barbie. Because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say this, but hey, I no longer work at Marvel. Barbie was my favorite movie of the year. My favorite superhero <laughs> movie, because Barbie's a hero. Um, <laughs> and so is America. That was the best. Um, so we're so happy that she was willing to come in and do this, like, part in this random episode of what if and she was so lovely about it she was great yeah all right we, we have to wrap this up here so we're going to throw a couple of quick last questions at you really quickly one last thing on the finale um this is something i've been part of the debate on on social media as well is captain carter using all the infinity stones we've seen one infinity stone almost kill a half celestial being so there's a debate on how the infinity stones didn't hurt or kill uh, uh captain carter there's yeah. the spell that's strange cast, the Ultron armor, things like that. I love to hear your side of that argument. How did Captain Carter survive using the Infinity Stones? With Cahorny's that's a storyboard artist thing. That was a storyboard artist storyboard choice. <laughs> it's it's with Cahorny's help. So you have to like really freeze frame and take a look. There's when Cahorny sends the stones to her, they're surrounded in Cahorny's um, power. So there's a there's a layer of space stone energy that's shielding it from ultimate death. So basically, kind of like the protective covering, like when you buy a new new record for those people who still buy records, the plastic sheen around the vinyl or whatever, if you will. But you see it a little bit. You see it when they fly up towards her, and then when her hands out and you get the close up of them reaching in, there's that faint blue glow around each of the stones. So she has basically it's like a little protective glove, so she won't immediately die. And that's that's probably and that's earlier like on, if you look, <laughs> what. Earlier on, if you look, when she has the armor on, she's never actually using all of the stones at once. Like, they're only a couple are lighting up if you pay attention, so you actually mm -hmm. never see her do the, like, all four activated uh, thing that proved painful to some of our other characters in the live action movies. Talk about needing a Hot Toys figure. <laughs> yes. Uh, Captain mm -hmm. Carter design, oh my gosh. But they, is, I assume that's also, that, that's like, because nobody held Thor's hammer, but they did use Cahorty's magic to move it. Yes, yes, yeah. and I also I, I'm also of the opinion that when those some of those individuals are bestowing their gifts upon the heroes to that that it is mm -hmm. their choice, right? So it, it, technically, someone probably could have picked up the hammer. He's like, uh, you know, quickly as I toss it, I'm just mentally saying I'm unlock I'm unlocking my phone <laughs> as it goes. You know what I mean? So I, I think in that sense, but yes, Cahorty is just controlling some of those things with her telekinesis and so can Peggy because she has a bunch of stones she can just move things with her mind you know they're they're they're, they're powerful at that moment so they can yeah. they can do a lot of cool stuff so that's so yeah. interesting so I know we've we've spoken about season three a little bit in this conversation I know Brian you mentioned that you're already working on it um do you have any sort of prediction whatsoever as to the time frame when we could see season three 
Uh, no, unfortunately, because they, they, they move stuff around. Every time I thought it was like, oh, it's going to be this. It's like, oh, it's going to move a little bit. So I can't, I couldn't even, I would hate to say something and have it be, have people hopes come up and, you know, and then have them be dashed because, you know, the beast of production and when things move around. I mean, I'd be surprised. I don't think, I don't think it's coming out. I thought that it could come out like at the end of the year, like in 2024, possibly, but um, it, that would be tight. And so I don't want to like, really state that and, and and they keep moving they've got there's some other group of people that are masterminding when things and they're moving mm -hmm. things on the board and so i don't know where we exist on that at this moment you know as well as zombies you know um zombies were still i'm working on at the same time and um that's gonna be crazy and that's coming out but that keeps moving around too right so um i i wish i could help you i can't, I can't. <laughs> zombies doing tvma animation right yeah t full tvma yeah oh god is that like the comic? Uh, well, it's it's spawning off of what was done on the episode of 106, mm -hmm. right? So um, the notion was it's like there's some inspiration from the comic, the fact that they're zombies, but we're not doing the comic like in any stretch. We have our own take on it. A lot of that stuff has been set up, you know, by our talented writers early on. So we're just taking that and you know and and moving some of those some of those ideas, you know, exploring that mythology in that episode a bit more you know yeah. um so yeah it's crazy ac mentioned a dark spider-man story that that spider-man story and the zombies <laughs> talk about heavy well listen uh matt ac brian thank you so much for hanging with us to talk about what if season two today we uh, this was so much fun to watch i loved every episode the season as a whole was fantastic right up to that finale where everything just went buck wild in the best way <laughs> uh we really really appreciate you talking with us about it Oh, thanks so uh, thank you so much for thanks having, for us, having us. us. Thank you guys, and good luck on future projects. Uh, Matt, are you, uh, I see you're. This is this is your. You have one episode in What If season three. I can't wait to see it. And this is your final hurrah with Marvel. Uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. You me or Matt? Matt's on season three. I'm not. Well, yeah. Did I say Matt? I meant to say AC. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I did one episode because it was supposed to be in season two, and now it's in season three. Um, which is going to be so weird. I wrote that in 2020. <laughs> uh, I'll see it in 2045. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've moved on to a couple of other things at other studios, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, I can't wait to see what you do next. I love Troll Hunters too, by the way. Ah, thanks. Uh, thank you for your work on this. Matt, Brian, good luck with season three. We can't wait to see it and hopefully talk to you about it again. Thank you. Thank you awesome, so much. Guys. Thank you so much, Brandon. This is so much fun. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for listening on Phase Zero, wherever you're listening. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye, everybody. Later.